Hey everyone, I'm Andy Raffel from eTechnics.com and you have to look at where do you take water cooling next. We have CPU blocks, we have GPU blocks. Well, today, we've got a memory block. So at the time of filming this, it's actually, well, kind of coming close up to Christmas, but this isn't actually launching until the day that you're probably watching this, which is the 8th of January. Bang in line with CES, and if you're actually looking for CES coverage, we have all that going on as well. But what I want to talk to you about is why. That is kind of the primary reason behind this. Essentially, memory is probably the coolest component of any computer system. So why does it need water cooling? Well, we actually delved into it and we wanted to, you know, do a few tests. So we wanted to run all of our conventional memory tests uh, in terms of, you know, seeing how far we could push it, seeing what the performance was. But we also wanted to sort of see what difference the memory block makes. But before we jump into that, let's talk a little bit about the specifications. So specification wise, these come in, well, two different kits. You can get the 16 gig kit or the 32 gig kit. So we've got the 32 gig kit, which comprises of four eight gig modules. Now, both kits actually operate at 3200 megahertz. And from what we're told by Thermaltake, they use Hynix ICs. And they've been quite particular about which particular ICs they use, which gives us a little bit of hope when it comes to maybe pushing it a little bit further through overclocking. In terms of the timings, it operates at 16, 18, 18, 38, and operates with a voltage of 1.35 volts. Now, this is nothing really out of the ordinary when comparing this against maybe other brand memory manufacturers out there, but you gotta remember, Thermaltake aren't actually a memory manufacturer. So this is, you know, something quite interesting to say that they've developed this, but I mean, are they actually manufacturing the modules themselves or are they sort of outsourcing it like Corsair would to ADATA? All we've actually been told is that yes, it's Hynix ICs, but that's pretty much as far as it goes. Now, in terms of the general style, it uses two millimeter thick aluminum uh, heat spreaders on the actual modules themselves. And obviously there is the water block that goes on top. Now the water block's actually copper based as well, which should help with heat dissipation. And there's actually two ways of doing this. So yes, it is a water block, so you can conventionally plug in a loop and sort of off you go, but there's actually nothing stopping you using it with say the water block without any liquid or just using the modules themselves. So general kind of convection based cooling. Either way, we've actually tested all of these different sort of cooling scenarios, and we will get through that in a little bit. Other key specifications of this is obviously XMP 2.0, and then when it comes down to the lighting, there's quite a lot to go through there. But before we do that, let's actually talk about some of the performance at both stock and overclock. Now we actually managed to get this from a 3200 megahertz stock speed up to 3600 megahertz, which isn't exactly groundbreaking, but it's still a little bit of extra performance for, well, free. So let's look at them glorious benchmarks. So that's pretty much the benchmarks out of the way. Now, I'm gonna be honest, when it comes to the benchmarks, yes, the definitive answer is that faster kits we tested with were faster and slower kits were slower. The problem with memory is it doesn't really make that much of a difference in the real world. I could essentially build two identical systems and one could be running at 3200 megahertz, one could be running at 3600 megahertz, and I guarantee you wouldn't actually notice the difference. There's just not that real push anymore. Now, unless you're sort of putting it under extreme conditions like LN2, yeah, you're probably not even gonna notice. But for the most part, do you know what I think this memory sort of kit is all about? It's all about the aesthetics. So let's talk a little bit about that. Now, as you can see, it does have this memory block on top. Now, it is copper-based and it has got eight different screws on it. So it's actually really, really simple to install. You simply put your modules into place and start screwing down the individual uh, hex screws with the included Allen key. 
Now, I wouldn't actually advise putting this on the modules sort of outside of a system. I'd always advise putting the modules in first and then putting the water block on top. The primary reason for that is you've got to remember it is going to get quite heavy. And if you're going to try and put that into your motherboard, I think it's maybe going to create some issues with flexing. And if everything doesn't line up quite the way that it should, I think, yeah, you can end up with some serious damage to both your motherboard and the memory modules themselves. Now, when you actually buy this, it does come fully included with everything that you need. So you get the modules, you get the water block, you get the microcontroller unit, which can also be plugged into other thermal tape products, such as RGB fans and other controllers. And obviously they can be daisy chained as well. You also get all of the other various cables. So cables to plug into the microcontroller unit or to plug directly into your motherboard. Cause you gotta remember being a thermal tape based product, Yes, you can use it with a Thermaltake TT RGB Plus software, but you can also control it for your motherboard software. So we're talking ASUS Aura Sync, MSI Mystic Lite, and Gigabyte Fusion. Now, talking about support, when it comes to the modules, they do actually list on the information that they gave to us that it's fully compatible with all Intel platforms from sort of Z170 upwards, but there was actually no listing of AMD. I can't see why there would be a problem with an AMD based system, but I do know Ryzen can be, well, a little bit picky when it comes to memory modules, but maybe that's something we can test in the future. Now, if you was going to use the TT RGB Plus software, yes, you can take control of basically the whole memory block. I think it's something like 16.8 million colors. It's absolutely ridiculous. And yes, there are different lighting effects as well. And I'm pretty sure we've got a lot of B-roll glam that we can show you of just a few of these various different lighting effects. We had things like radar, scan, wave, and raindrop. So yes, they do make some really pretty patterns. And yes, you can synchronize it with your board or other thermal tape products. Now, the only other sort of key thing is like you get with every other memory module out from other competitor brands is yes, it does come with a lifetime warranty, but we're actually unsure whether that lifetime warranty is just on the modules or if it's on the water block and the controller and the whole package is one. I'm guessing as they're selling it as a whole package that the lifetime warranty would cover everything. I mean, there's not really too much that can go wrong. When you look at LEDs, they kind of, you know, do have a very high life expectancy. So lifetime warranty, yeah, hopefully it's on the whole thing. Now, talking about other things that we actually tested, the main thing that we wanted to do was test, I guess, the heat dissipation. Because yes, we know memory modules don't really have, you know, too much to worry about when it comes to temperatures, but there must be a very good reason why Thermaltake developed a product like this. So let's actually run through, I guess, the figures that we had of the memory modules as bare standalone modules with the block on top with no loop, and then with the block on top with a loop. So starting with the modules when we actually just run them without the water block. At idle, they were getting 29 degrees, which, you know, isn't exactly hot in the grand scheme of things. When you think even most CPUs run a little bit hotter than that at idle. So we pretty much had, you know, quite a good base mark to go from. We decided to go into ADA64 and run one of the stress stability tests just on the memory. And it actually only went up to sort of 35 degrees. So again, not exactly, you know, hot as hell or anything. Then we decided to put just the water block on top and basically had it running like you can see now with no custom loop or anything connected. And at that, it actually dropped ever so slightly. And this is probably down to the copper base of the water block. So it went from that 29 degrees down to 25. So a four degrees drop isn't you know groundbreaking, but it's still something. When we loaded it up again, using ADA64 in their stress stability test, we actually managed to get exactly the same results, 35 degrees. So yes, it was good at idle, but at load, well, it didn't really actually make a difference. Then it was time to actually connect it up to a custom loop and see exactly what it could do. This is where we did actually see some good differences. So at idle, we had 24 degrees, which, you know, isn't exactly a huge drop from the idle temperature that we had of just a block on its own, but still it's something. But where it really did shine was when we actually had it at load running water around the whole system. We managed to get 28.5 degrees, which I'm sure you agree from the 35 degrees that we were getting before, you know, there's quite a big difference. But in all honesty, I don't think this is all about the performance. Like I say, memory doesn't really need cooling down. I think it's all to do with the aesthetics and having that kind of full ecosystem. And I can't really blame Thermaltake for doing that because they have fans, they have chassis, they have power supplies. They pretty much have everything when it comes to, you know, the core components of a computer, barring obviously a motherboard and a graphics card. So 
maybe this is a kind of, you know, next progressional step for them. Having something that just ties in with the rest of the system and, you know, gives you that pleasing aesthetic look. And yes, it is RGB, but that doesn't mean you need to have it sort of throwing up and spewing unicorns and rainbows all the time. You could have it as a solid color, or if you really wanted, you could turn it off. It's entirely up to you. But there is one thing that we do want to kind of know, and that comes down to pricing. Now, pricing on this is a little bit of a weird one because at the time of filming, it hasn't actually been released, but we do know what the MSRP is, at least in America. So pricing for the 16 gigabyte kit is $249.99 plus taxes and shipping. For the 32 gigabyte kit like we've got here, it's a stonking $439. I mean, this is actually quite a bit more expensive than rivals out there like G-Skill with their Trident Z, Corsair with their Vengeance Pro RGB. You know, if you're trying to pit something against each other that's very similar and still has RGB, that's kind of what you have to look at. On average, it was about $80 to $110 difference. But when you actually look at it, what you're getting extra for that, you're getting all the cables and the controller, you're getting the water block itself. And when you actually drill down into the pricing, 80 to sort of $110 is pretty much what you'd actually pay for a CPU block. So I don't actually think that's too bad of a deal, especially if you're really craving that aesthetic ecosystem look. Let us know what you kind of think in the comments section below. I'd really like to actually get people's opinion. Is this kind of the way forward or is it just, I don't know, an unnecessary product? Personally, I love the look of it. I think it looks absolutely great, but yeah, it doesn't really, it's not really justified for the performance side of things. Aesthetics, yes. Performance, definitely not. There you go. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, you know exactly what to do and I'll see you in the next video. See you later. Bye-bye.